Those final verses of chapter 13, 25 to 34, he's actually talking specifically to, to the twelve themselves. What lessons come out of those teachings? I think they're they're troubling if you don't understand that context. Mm -hmm. They appear also in the in the New Testament in Matthew chapter six. And when you read those, don't worry about what you wear. Don't worry about your food. That's a rigorous lifestyle, and and I I think it I think it inspired an ascetic trend in Christianity mm -hmm. to be, you know, here's a man who fasted for forty days, who taught, don't worry about what you eat, don't worry about what you wear. And the Book of Mormon has this. I, I love it as a New Testament person and has studying it. I love the fact that he kind of undermined that whole idea. This is to the twelve and, and possibly to focus, um, to minister unto the people, as he says in verse 25. Therefore, here's how I want you to go forward in the ministry. And, and of course, there are important principles for all of us, but it's not always in our life that we can not worry about food and not worry about what we wear, but in, as missionaries, there He's are talking great... to full-time uh, servants in the kingdom, those who are authorities of the church and the missionaries. They don't need to be concerned about what they're going to wear and how they're going to eat. Other people are taking care of them while they're consecrated to uh, the service of the Lord. And he'll reiterate okay. that again in Matthew chapter 12, or ch chapter 10, where he sends them out on a mission. He will reiterate some of this language, you know, don't don't go with person script. And so I, I read it that he's talking to them, as you said, maybe as missionaries. Hmm. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. If uh, our desire is to build the kingdom, that's number one. The Lord's willing to bless us with uh, other things that we desire that are good for us to help build the kingdom. Sometimes we get caught up, though, in that building the kingdom is secondary in our lives. Um, and, and so I love when he says that here, we've, we need to refocus because our lives do get busy in many aspects and there's many things pulling on us. Um, and many responsibilities that we have in families and in civic life and everything. And there is time for those things, but ultimately the kingdom of God is where it's at. Mm -hmm. And we need to be focused and not distracted by the other things. doesn't mean that we can't do them. We do need to do them, but we need to have the focus on the building up of the kingdom. Each of us do it in just very, very small ways, but, but the things that we do make a difference. And uh, to be a part of that that great process is, is one of the great things of mortality. I think. Some people think, that, well, I'm not really doing anything to build the kingdom. Whatever your work is, whatever you're doing out there, it's to help take care of your family, and your family is building the kingdom. We're all building. I, I am third. Hmm? He's first. All those around me are second. I'm third. And when I put myself in first position, hmm, causes me and others problems. Yeah. Well, it comes so. back to not having the will of the Father, right? We need to be the will of the yeah. Father needs to be first and foremost. Mm. So he continues, judge not that you be not judged. What does that mean? You know, chapter, chapter 13 is dealing with uh, our motivation. Why are we doing what we do? Uh, it, are we doing it because of our concern out of uh, what man thinks, or are we doing it because of what God thinks? And now when we transition into chapter 14, he's talking about these uh, more horizontal relationships between people. Judge not that you be not judged. Um, it's an expectation that I have to be some, to act one way, in order that others also are, act in a similar way. That, that we're now dealing with uh, these issues of judging. Um, for example, judge not that you be not judged. Um, if if we want to receive blessings, uh, we need to expect to be a certain way. Um, and and that will just continue throughout this. You know, oftentimes we. We see the we we see the little teeny speck that's in somebody's eye, and yet, as he describes it here, we have a beam in our own eye. But aren't we um, supposed to be judging, you know, uh, judging what's good for us, whether what literature we should be reading and what not, what we should be uh, taking into our bodies and what not, uh, what, what kind of movies we should be watching and what uh, better not? Are, are we always judging? 
the the significance of this teaching is what? Judge not unrighteously. Unrighteously. Mm -hmm. we're, we're always needing to make good judgments in our life, but not to judge unrighteously. Whatever judgment we pass on others, that's what we're, how we're going to be judged yeah. too. You know, Elder Oaks came to BYU a number of years ago and he gave a talk on judging and judging not. He made some great statements that I'd like to, to read because he, it, I think, helps to elucidate what's going on here. He says, we must refrain, I think, I believe that the scriptural command to judge not refers most clearly to the final judgment. We must refrain from making final judgments on people because we lack the knowledge and the wisdom to do so. We would even apply the wrong standards. The world's way is to judge competitively between sinners and losers. The Lord's way of final judgment will be to apply his perfect knowledge of the law to a person has received and to judge on the basis of what a person's circumstances, motives, actions throughout his or her entire life. God will judge properly. But we do need to judge, and he says, he gives us four ways that we can judge righteously, what that means. Number one, a righteous judgment must be, by definition, must be immediate. It must be for a here and now thing. It's not talking about the final judgment. Number two, a righteous judgment will be guided by the spirit of the Lord, not by anger, revenge, jealousy, or self-interest. Number three, to be righteous, an intermediate judgment must be within our stewardship. And four, we should, if possible, refrain from judging until we have adequate knowledge of the facts. If That's part of the problem. Sense. We're usually not in possession of all the facts. Absolutely. and We don't know why somebody is, is acting the way they are or why they said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that that's a great discussion on what it means to judge righteously. Okay. I think also there's there's this powerful image too, and and uh, I I think it, it typifies a way that Savior liked to teach with something like hyperbole. You know, here here's a person who has a tiny little splinter in their eye, and then the word beam there could really be log. It, it's this ridiculous image. You have a log sticking out of your eye. And, and if you were to try and take something out of someone's eye with a log sticking in yours, you're going to knock them around and, mm -hmm. and hurt them. And I think that really says when we endeavor in the improper ways to judge, we, we actually end up hurting the person we judge and then eventually ourselves. And that's a real insight into human behavior that he has, you know, that we offend when we don't have all the facts. And uh, that's one of my favorite images. And yet it's very dramatic. It kind of shows Jesus' style. I, I have a copy of hymn number 91 in the old hymn book before 95, I mean before 1985. Let each man learn to know himself. Somebody cleverly wrote this this way. Let each man learn to know himself to gain that knowledge, let him labor. Improve those failings in himself, which he condemns so in his neighbor. How lenient our own faults we view and consciousness voice adeptly smother. Yet, oh, how harshly we review the selfsame failings in another. And if you meet an erring one whose deeds are blamable and thoughtless, consider ere you cast the stone if you yourself are pure and faultless. Oh, list to that small voice within whose whisperings oft make men confounded and trumpet not another sin, you'd blush deep if your own were sounded. And in self-judgment, if you find your deeds to others are superior, to you has providence been kind, as you should be to those inferior. Example sheds a genial ray of light which men are apt to borrow. So first improve yourself today and then improve your friends tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, well put, huh? Mm -hmm.